Uh, welcome to the Sports Idol podcast. Uh, we are digging deep today with Gabe Gardner. Gabe is a two-time Olympian and gold medalist with the Beijing Olympics for men's volleyball in 2008. And not only is Gabe an impressive player, but he's also a coach and a dad, which for us at Sports Idol Nation is the trifecta of guests. So we are very much looking forward to digging into some of the information that he has for us. And we're very lucky that he brought along his son, Harper Gardner, who is also a student athlete. Um, and yeah, we're looking forward to digging into both of their lives and hearing what they have to say. So welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for coming to Sports Idol Nation. Thanks for having us. Thanks, great to be here. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, now you've probably been on a few podcasts, but is this your first podcast? Is this your first formal interview? Yeah, yes it is. Yes, yeah. I love, there's nothing more than I love than winning. And yeah. we win, we have him first. <laughs> um, but you've done a few podcasts. Um, we go way back, um, probably even before college. College days, high school, I don't remember exactly when, I've, but you've been kind of part of the volleyball world forever. It feels like forever, um, but yeah, I, I remember you from our earliest days on the national team in college and some of our mutual friends when you were at UOP was, yeah, we go way back. Yes. Way yeah. back. Yes. Um, now, can you, I'm going to let you tell everyone a little bit about your playing background. Um, so tell us how awesome of a player you were. Well, I was, I guess, awesome enough to, to get to the level that I aspired to get to when I was a uh, you know, high school kid and, and dreaming about the Olympics. Um, so that was obviously a great honor and kind of my lifetime goal when I started out playing volleyball. I started out as a freshman um, at San Clemente High School down in Southern California. Mm. It was kind of a cool sport. We could play it on the beach. And, um, but I was a three sport athlete in high school. So I played water polo, I played basketball and volleyball was my third sport of my spring sport. And oh. It just kind of took off. My love of the game um, sort of was inspired mostly about the fun part of playing on the beach in the summers and being around that kind of culture and environment. And I was fortunate enough to uh, grow to a pretty pretty volleyball-friendly size at 6'9 mm -hmm. <laughs> and by my junior year, which my son over here is not quite there yet, but maybe, maybe. Getting, getting there. We'll see. <laughs> Still growing. <laughs> and probably, yeah. Stop feeding him. But so that so that definitely helped, uh, you know, having the height and the coordination and the love of the game. Um, but you know, I, I mean, you know, you kind of know a little bit about my story with with respect to college. I had a tough college, kind of ride through the college ranks. I I went to USC out of college um, when I was a major recruit in volleyball. Mm -hmm. Ran into a buzzsaw with the wrong coach my second year there. That didn't go well. I had a lot of teammates. Um, really struggle with that coach as well, quit the team, kind of led me to ultimately consider transferring before there was a transfer portal, mm -hmm. before there was really, it was actually really challenging for student athletes to yeah. transfer. Like you had to get the permission of the school and your coach. And and uh, and part of the reason I went to SC, to be honest, was was I really loved the school and the campus, but I, I went there because of the coach that recruited me, was a coach by the name of Jim McLaughlin that mm -hmm. ended up becoming the University of Washington's head coach, very successful for many years on the women's side later on. But he had won a national championship at USC. He also coached me on, I was like one of the first high school players to ever make the World University Games team out yeah. of high school, which was pretty unique, and That's he was impressive. a coach. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, that was a big reason why I went to SC, and he left after my freshman year kind of unexpectedly okay. and was replaced by a coach that just, um, you know, was a real challenge for the whole program. And gotcha. So when, when I transferred to Stanford, um, you know, felt right at home right away and loved the school, but again, ran into some challenges with the coaching staff there uh, along with other players and ultimately – didn't have the most memorable college career, but hmm. I think, um, you know, what I try to impart on Harper and all the athletes I talk to is really this like thing that, you know, that we all, every athlete knows that's made it to that level, which is like, you can't let other people tell you what you can and can't do or where you're going to get to. True. Like it's got to come from inside you and your belief in yourself, no matter what kind of coach you have, no matter what kind of injury right. you've been through. Yeah. 
And you got to have that like persistence, resiliency to like overcome anything that's thrown in front of you to meet your goals. And, and I feel like that's my biggest life story in, in terms of sports, because realistically, I was probably on the border of getting cut when I first got out of college at Stanford because my college career was so poor mm -hmm. in terms of like all American or having success. Right. But I had the talent and the ability. I just needed to now, the only place I could really prove it now was professionally, internationally, or every summer when we were in Colorado playing with a national team. So kind of a new start, new people, new coaches, yeah. new voices. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, fortunately, you know, had a real, I, I, think, I think the turning point in my career was really after my, so just for the audience to know, so I, I, when I graduated Stanford in 2000, I had this pretty terrible experience with two sets of coaches and, and a bad career in college. I mean, bad relative to, sure. to, yeah. to most other players that made the Olympic team. Right. Forgettable. I'd like to say forgettable. Okay. Um, I didn't make the team in 2000 for the Sydney Olympics. Um, I was an alternate for it. But then, like, around 2001, 2002, this new wave of players came into the men's indoor team, mm -hmm. kind of the next generation, my generation, and kind of the old guard went out and kind of moved on and went to the beach. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you were there. We were all going through it at the same time. Like, it was like, you know, you had to start from the bottom and work your way up. Yeah. And um, I think the first summer I got, I got cut at the end of the summer, and then the following summer – after I'd spent kind of an average year in Greece playing professionally my first season, um, the second year I got an opportunity to make the world championship team. And I should have probably made the team, but they cut me like the, as the last person. I was like the last guy to get cut before world championships in 2002. Okay. Uh -huh. And it really kind of devastated me. Okay. But I was fortunate because at the time, my, the head coach, who's one of my idols and my mentors nowadays, and a uh, coach by the name of Doug Beal, he was our 84 coach. He was a gold medals coach in 84. He was involved with USA Volleyball all through the 80s and 90s. Eventually retook the helm of the, of the head coaching position in 90s, excuse me, in 2000. Okay. And then he also coached us through 2004 but in 2002 when he cut me from the world championship team he kind of pulled me aside and took took a, mo a little bit more of a moment and said like you know you, sh you proved something different to me this year this summer than you did previously in the three or four years you've been coming out here because I used to mm -hmm. come out while I was in college too in the yeah. summertime yeah you know and I rotate like players 90s, and see how yeah. people do and yeah yeah 97 98 99 I was still there but yeah. he's like you you know this this is the first time I've really seen like you shouldn't give up and I want to make sure that you go to a professional team where you're going to grow into the player I know you can become mm. and so I'm like, okay, where are you going? Well, I got this opportunity for you to play in Buenos Aires for this new team in Argentina that's – the coach of it is actually an old Argentinian national team player that played over in Italy for a bunch of years, like okay. 10 years in Argentina. It's like one of the more famous Argentinian volleyball players that ever came out of Argentina for, on the men's side. Mm -hmm. a guy by the name of um, Daniel, Daniele Castellani. So just having the right coach in the right situation, I was able to move um, down to Argentina and just like completely unlock the mental side and yeah. got over the hump and just like took off from there. How we, wise of Doug though to recognize that what exactly you needed and to say, and to have the foresight to, you know, give you the chance to, to go prove yourself and not just go at, you're not cutting it, sorry. Uh, but he kind of read you and knew what you needed and knew a person. So he sent you there. On he basically purpose. sent me there on purpose. Yeah. And it was like, it was like one of, the, financially, it was one of the worst contracts I ever played for, but it was the best situation. Was best, I ever, yeah. Because I wasn't making a ton of money, mm -hmm. but it also, Argentina, Argentina in 2002. You know, shout out to my Argentina people, but yeah. it was going through a tough time back then, and it had kind of devalued against the dollar. So, like, a little bit of money went a lot of way down there. Yeah, it was an awesome 
it was like the best fan base in the world that I've ever played in front of. Like our mm-hmm. whole city was in the gym jumping the whole time and people were on the streets. That's and so we fun. And we started a team that was their first year in the small little town called Bolivar. And it was like kind of in the middle of the Pampas, you know, the, the kind of breadbasket of Argentina, real farming areas, little small town. And everybody came to the game. It yeah. was like, you know, 3,000 people, everybody, that's all there was to do in the city. Yeah. And they loved us. And it was like the first time in my life where I felt like the entire world was watching me and like loved what I was doing. Yeah. So kind of like you got inspired from the crowd while it, you're playing yeah, down there. Yeah, feeds and, your energy. And, and, and then we won the championship. Okay. So I won my first ever like championship, like where winning it all really mattered. And mm-hmm. you get a taste of that, you get over that hump winning, and it kind of like took off from there. That's a good example of, of sometimes money isn't the purpose. Like the reason, the blessing in disguise there is going there regardless, and, and money didn't have really much to do with it at all. It was the it was the experience and knowing that you are preparing for something because someone saw something in you, and this was your shot. Yeah, and I mean. Like I, I love Doug for that moment too because he didn't he didn't re- like he had right probably thirty players that were going different places that he yeah. could push in certain places but he actually cut me and then was like but I want you to do this and this I think this will be good for you yeah and he was totally right because when I came back from Argentina in two thousand two that summer in two thousand three was really like that key summer to make the World Cup team you're a year out from the two thousand four Olympics mm-hmm. like that's the summer that's like where everything's decided on whether you're going to the Olympics. And you know, because, like, most people don't know, in volleyball at least, like, if there's such a team dynamic, you're not going to, like, like maybe 11 and 12 is going to come in, like, right. right before the games. But most of the team is formed yeah, in the coach's mind, like, a year to 18 months to two years out. Yeah. You're not going to come in and, like, make any waves or – No. Yeah. yeah, so so like actually not making the world championship team was a little bit of a, a knock on me. But then that next summer after Argentina, I was like 10 times better than everybody. That's I mean, awesome. I was just doing, I was dominating. And then I was starting on the World Cup team, you know, for the majority of our matches. And, yeah. and I just kind of shot out of a catapult from that situation in Argentina and kind of unlocked something different in me. That's cool. That's kind um, of the unconventional way to do it. I love those unconventional stories. And I, my story on getting on the national team is, is also very unconventional. And I won't say it right now because the show no, isn't, I about, isn't, know about isn't about it. me. No, I want to know about it. No, no, no. But, but, you, ver- but you were a middle blocker and that, that became an I w- amazing I was libero. A, I was a middle that became a libero, yes. Um, but most Right when the libero position was first created. Was first created. And most people um, don't remember that time. I do. No, did. they don't. Yeah, it was created in 2000 for the Sydney Olympics. And then it became became part of the college game two years later. It was adopted yeah. by everybody else. Yeah. Um, but not only that, was it a, there a big position change for me, but there was also, I had been out of college for six years before I got onto the national team. No way. So when I got onto the national team, when I was invited, I was one of the newest, but one of the oldest. Oh, wow. So that was a, a weird dynamic yeah. um, going into a gym where like, I'm older than you, but you've already played in two Olympics before me. Like, <laughs> okay, what do I have to prove here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, I, I love the unconventional stories and no, no story of how you get there is, is quite the same, but I do yeah. want to kind of revisit the pre story. Um, yeah. cause I was, when you, when you committed to USC, um, going through those recruiting days, um, and choosing a college that you want to go to, um, I was doing a little bit of, of research knowing that you were coming on the show um, and I was watching some other podcasts and trying to see like what other podcasts had asked you and what you'd talked about. I didn't want to repeat some of the same information, but um, I was I stumbled upon a podcast um, from I think it was back in 2020 when we were all locked in our homes and everyone had a podcast because that's what we had yeah, to do while yeah. we were locked in our house trying to stay relevant and productive. Um, and it was a podcast by CrossNet. Uh-huh. Um, and if you don't know what CrossNet is, it's like a, a net system that crosses like this, and it's kind of like Foursquare for volleyball. Yeah, it's, so fun. Um, it's a fun game. Have you yeah. played it? No, I was literally. I'm in a student government here at Rio. That's so funny you say it. And we were literally. I was looking up CrossNets to Cross, buy. Oh, you definitely <laughs> gotta get it. <laughs> so in that's there. funny. Get it in there. You will. You'll kill it. Um, but it's a fun game. But the the company CrossNet had their own podcast show, yep. and they hired Ryan Millar yep. to host this podcast. Um, and I was looking for yours, but on the way to looking for your podcast episode, I stumbled upon Kevin Hambly's podcast episode. 
Um, and I played for Kevin in, yep. in Minnesota for the professional team there. And then he brought me to the national team with him and taught me all the USA stuff. So that's how I ended uh-huh. up on the national team was Kevin. But I love hearing him tell stories. He's a great storyteller. Uh-huh. So I clicked on his podcast and Ryan was asking Kevin if he remembered um, Ryan's uh, recruiting trip his official visit and Kevin said yes I absolutely remember your visit it was you and Goose and some guy named Greg that went to Pacific which I think is Greg Wakeham <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and he told the story about how you know Ryan ended up there yeah um, but he said at the end of this visit dude Goose and Greg were definitely definitely not coming they took you into some haunted forest <laughs> do you remember this trip <laughs> yes I remember Please tell us what happened. What? Like, what did you do in a haunted forest? It doesn't sound like you've told Harper this no, story at all. I've never heard this. Tell no. us what you did in the haunted forest. No, they just, they were basically like, you know, it's it's BYU, so the culture is a little bit different there. Yeah, and yeah. like, you, you know, there's, there's um, it was just like, sort of like, hey, we're going to go up into the mountains and we're going to sit around the campfire and sing guitar and sing Kumbaya. Okay. And I just remember a lot being like, okay, this is not what I envisioned for my <laughs> recruiting trip. But at the same time, I do remember they took us to a comedy show where Gallagher, the guy who used to oh, smash, yeah, smash, smash watermelons, watermelons uh-huh. on stage, yeah. that was pretty fun. So okay. like, we went to a comedy show and they smashed watermelons. I was like, yeah, this BYU is pretty fun. So I oh. had a great trip there. I just think that it was always started out being like the lowest of the five trips that I wanted. Like I, I more went there like, am I gonna be surprised? Cause mm-hmm. I was yeah. I was probably like a USC, UCLA, Pepperdine or Stanford guy to begin with. Yeah. Um, and I think they kind of knew that yeah. like, and still had me out. Yeah. But I, I, I remember sick. Hambly cause um, he was, yeah. I mean, it's so funny that you bring up Hamley because now he's the coach of Stanford. He's the coach of Stanford. Yeah. Yep. So yep. Illinois to Stanford. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, yeah, that was a funny story. Um, as, I, as you probably go on and go to recruiting visits and have your official visits, which I think, you know, recruiting is definitely different now than it was when we were being recruited with the official visits being relevant and everything. Yeah. But man, official visits, oh. <laughs> They can be really, a lot of them are very cookie cutter. A lot of places do the same stuff. Um, And that's what Ryan said, that all of his visits were very cookie cutter. And then he went to BYU and they took him into a haunted forest and recreated like the Blair Witch Project or something. And it was the part of the reason that he chose that. And I was like, man, that's part of the reason I chose Pacific too, (laughs) because Pacific was my first, was my first visit. I only took three. Um, and the other two were very cookie cutter. They do yeah. all the same stuff with all the recruits yeah. and, tr- you know, try to show their flashy stuff and take them to clubs and parties and things. Yeah. Um, but Pacific, no, no. Pacific, um, I was Thai. I remember being in a dorm room with a teammate that I played club with that was already there. And she was dating one of the guys on the men's team. And we were all in a dorm room and watching movies. And then all of a sudden the tone totally changed and the guys, um, took up uh, some belts and tied my arms to a chair and they made me watch Fletch <laughs> all night. And I was what? like, this is, if people if people can create good times where there's no good times, that's the place I need to be. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so I ended up choosing Pacific for multiple reasons, but that was a very unconventional, um, kind of weird recruiting visit also. Well, it's memorable though. It's, it's very, yeah. It's, it's, and, and to be fair, just so everybody knows, ULP was the worst place for us to go play volleyball against on the men's side because Addie and her whole team would come heckle us from the sideline. That's what we do. <laughs> That's what we do. They were really good at torturing us while the, the opposing team while we were playing on the men's side. That, well, we had to, we, we were in a competition with the men's team because the men's team would do it for us. They, yeah. when we would play Long Beach and Santa Barbara and Hawaii would come to town like all these big dogs and we're you know vying for a conference title. And the men's team shows up in wigs and half naked and body paint, <laughs> and they are just front row on the court, yep. like in your face. And I was like, okay. Yeah, D- Addie definitely heckled to. me in college. Like, for I sure. think you guys showed up with pink knee pads one time, and we were like, oh, get them, get those pink knee pads. You guys did your own That's laundry, the, didn't you? Yes, we did. Oh, it was funny. Um, good college times. Um, but again, speak, kind of going along with the with the college times and going off into college. Now, you transferred from USC. You talked a little bit about mm-hmm. that. We don't have to rehash wise or anything. But um, 
the por- the portal now is a thing, and it's very different. As you mentioned, when we tra- if we transferred, um, when we were playing, it was kind of something that was kind of frowned upon. Like that was yeah. not a good. People did yeah. not kind of discourage transferring. Yeah. Um, and now it's like it seems like the easiest thing in the world to do. And some coaches are like loving it. Like Texas absorbed a bunch of transfers, mm-hmm. and they're winning national championships with transfers. Um, and kids are entering the portal simply because they're not happy. Like, what, you know, is, is transferring. So say he goes to college, um, whether, whatever sport he's going to college in, and he, you know, finds himself in a, in a place where he's not unhappy, but he's not happy um, and he wants to transfer. Are you going to incur it? What are your words of advice to him and other athletes that, that are considering just jumping into the portal. Well, I think I think you've got to start with like, what are you looking out? What are you looking for when you first go to a school anyway? Like, mm-hmm. right? Is it the right fit for you, the school? Mm-hmm. And for me, um, like just going back, having some hindsight, looking back, like I think I always knew I should have gone to Stanford out of high school. Okay. Um, but there were some financial considerations. I didn't get quite a full ride to go there. I, at the time, I had gotten a full ride to SC. So I had, I had a little bit of like um, financial thoughts about my family. Like I didn't want my parents to pay for college at all for me when I was getting full rides elsewhere. So I was a little bit like sold a little bit short on Stanford from a financial perspective and that came into play. But also I think Stanford, I was a little bit intimidated even though I was a valedictorian and had really good grades in high school. Mm-hmm. By the way, Harper does too, like yeah. has those types of grades to go to wherever he wants. And mm-hmm. I'm so proud of him for that. And it's like the number one thing I say to stu- any student athlete, like focus on school first and where you're going to school. Got it. But I think I, as a, as a high school athlete that my parents hadn't gone through recruiting or anything, I just, I didn't really know if I could hack Stanford as a student. I was a little intimidated by it. So I kind of sold myself short on being able to step up to that level of academia uh-huh. at the, what Stanford represented. So I went to SC and no, no fault of SC, pretty quickly learned that SC was a lot easier at the time, mm-hmm. at the time I went there. Right? Mm-hmm, Remember, sure. this is in yes. 96, time 97. Is for sure. Yeah. Um, USC is a uber competitive school today, and yeah. their academics are amazing. Yeah. So n- no shade on USC, but it's like, at the time I went there, a, it, was, it was pretty easy to get into SC, and a lot of, like, this, the classes and the academic work wasn't as difficult. And now yeah. I was a kinesiology major there, so it was on the harder s- scale mm-hmm. of majors at USC, but it wasn't like I really had to struggle to get to, you know, decent grades. Right, right, right. So okay. I kind of underperformed when I went to SC, too. So you can also then kind of help him make a better decision ahead of time and do some better homework before you commit to a school so that you don't have to enter the portal. Well, I, I well, I think that the, the, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of like, I, I just, what I tell Harper and what I tell anybody that would ask me is like, don't ever underestimate yourself what you're capable of Got it. just okay. because of academics, like first and foremost. Mm-hmm. And then by the same token, always play for the best team in athletics. And like I just told him that yesterday, it's like you don't, yeah. you don't ever want to, like put yourself in a position. Like I, I made some bad choices professionally after when we were playing overseas professionally, mm-hmm. where I was like, well, they're offering me more money, and they're like fourth or fifth in the league last year. But realistically, I was always better off taking less money, playing for the best team in the league, and mm-hmm. having success, and being around other guys that were really good and challenging me. Yeah. And it's kind of the same thing with school. Like I felt like I, yeah. when I did transfer to Stanford, and once I got ingrained in Stanford, I knew that's the place I should have always been because mm-hmm. the academics were a, a notch above, because the people there were not like it, there, there was just a better connection to Stanford yeah. once I arrived there. That I was like. I should have came here from the beginning. I shouldn't have yeah. second guessed myself. Got it. Always go to the best school. Always play for the best team. Was kind of my advice to younger kids. That's good. That's good advice. Now, do you? Sorry to cut you no. off, but if I want to go on with with Harper too. You want to go to college in something? You play other sports though. What what sports do you play? Um. So I play. Wa- my main sport is water polo. Okay. Actually, men's water polo. I'm a goalie position. Okay. Um. So 
had some success there yeah. in this past season, this high school season. Nice. Um, we won our first D1 section title as a school. Legit. Yeah, so that was pretty awesome. Congrats. Reppin'. Yeah, um, there you go. And uh, just started up club down at uh, American River Water Polo. Club Water Polo, okay. Yeah, yeah, and that's just starting to ramp up into the winter season and uh, okay. getting down there and super excited for what that is. So it was water polo, you said club water polo and school water polo. Are there different seasons like in volleyball? Like yeah. you have high school volleyball and yeah. club volleyball? Okay. Yeah, absolutely, okay. yeah, just the same. And then, so right now I'm a, I'm a dual sport athlete, so I'm going to play volleyball as well this spring. Okay. Um, just for some good cross training. It's a great mental break. Um, yeah. You know, there's a lot of, tra even though they seem like totally opposite sports, there's a ton of translation, you know, blocking a water polo ball, blocking a volleyball. Yeah. I mean, reading hitters, reading shooters. Yeah. Very, very similar. You yeah, know? good. Um, That's so good. A lot of it's overhead, too. Like, yeah. there's still some L overhead same, stuff. Same arm motion. Uh huh. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Is it, um, so volleyball, obviously, you, you, we have the ground to mm -hmm. use for power and stuff. Yeah. Is it, is height, because you're, you're what, six feet? Six? Six, six, yeah. Six, six. And you're how old? Uh, 16. 16. Is that a junior or junior? Junior, junior yeah. Year? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, is height an advantage in water polo, even though you can't touch the ground? Like, is it, like, yeah. Is no, it it's it's incredibly. Mostly, I feel like it's, um, it's arm length. I mean, ah, there's, okay. like, wingspan is a big deal in water polo. I mean, I know some kids that are even on the shorter side, but mm -hmm. have a amazing like just longer arms and it's a big deal you know being able to hold out the ball um where you can shoot like shot blocks are a big deal so like where you're putting your arm up against another person okay yeah. right uh -huh. and if if they sh if they have the ability to shoot over you mm -hmm. your sh your arm there is not doing very much and yeah. that's a big big consideration and then at my position you know just covering cage distance how how long can your arm reach you know your angles arm Obviously, your height and your arm, arm span. Comes you, mu that. you must need a, a lot of lower body strength too, because mm -hmm. if you're treading water and then you have to burst to go up toward yeah. the corner, like you got to get up there. Like how there's sure. probably a lot of technical stuff yeah, involved. Yeah, in absolutely. Um, it's mostly lower body strength, a lot of hip work. Huh. Um, so just just all all your explosive power is coming from your legs, your arms. Like a lot of like higher level goalie training is literally just like you're not your hands are as light as possible. You're just ready to mm -hmm. go wherever you need to go with those arms like super ready and quick, not using your hands very much. Okay, now is goalie the position that you want to play? Did you get thrust into that spot or did you pick it? Um, it was it was a choice for sure. I came into water polo very unsure. I was not like a, like starting early. Um, I was like kind of a awkward 14, like 13, 14 year old kid coming All into All 13 that. and 14 year olds are awkward, FYI. <laughs> just let you know that. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> just, it's a it's a super challenging sport out of the gates, very physically demanding. And um, I just, I felt like a lot of like, just kind of talent out of the gates for goalie and just felt r right at the position. Okay. And then just continued from there, just kept, I got the opportunity to play at like a higher team because I was the goalie. Sure. Like right out of the gates, usually most people make it like a, you know, a C, B team, C team. But because mm -hmm. I was the goalie and I showed some early talent, I was able to make like the 14 ones team and go like down to bigger tournaments, which really impacted my career. I think. Bigger tournaments like the one you went to in Greece. Hey, did you go? To, you go to, went to Greece for water polo. Yes. Uh, yeah. This last summer, I played on the. Um, it was a it was a future trip with the junior national team down in Greece. Oh wow, yeah. that's big time. Yeah, it was, pretty, cool. it was an amazing experience. Can so I give you a you little? And, yeah, yeah go, can go I ahead. give you a little sidebar on his Greece trip? Please do. Yeah, he's being modest. He's he's the 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 number one goalie for our central zone region, which extends all the way down to Fresno, all the way to San Luis Obispo, basically anything outside the Bay Area for our okay. region. So he was the the top goalie selected in that region, and then with all the goalies all across America mm -hmm. was selected in a select few to go to this Greece trip. So he's that's he's amazing. on he's in the USA water polo pipeline and and that's his main start and he's extremely, extremely good. Um, that's awesome. I know that and I can say that because I was a goalie in water polo and I played in high school and I actually got um, LA and Orange County water polo athlete of the year my senior year in high school. Oh I didn't know that. I didn't know you were a water polo player also. <laughs> Yeah, so I was I was not just a water polo player. I was the best one in LA and Orange County my senior year in high school as nice. a goalie like him. Nice. So I um, 
but I, I, I only say that to know that like, like he's extremely, extremely ahead of the curve in terms of his position yeah, in a yeah. short amount of time. Yeah. And I just think the sky's the limit for him. Um, also, just the fact that, you know, with he led the team to sort of a pretty miraculous, like, 13 to 12 final game win by blocking some balls at the end yeah. against number oh, eight that's Davis. Exciting. You know, number eight Davis in the state. The state of California is the best water pool state in the country by far. And Davis was number eight. Rio was like 15. So we won a pretty big match to win the section. That's, that's never happened amazing. before. Yeah. So I, I, you know, that's good experience too to to know to how to do that. Yeah, that's a amazing. skill in itself is trying to take totally. a team that you are the underdog yeah. and figure out how to beat them yeah. and do it. Yeah, yeah they dude. lost two times before to them in the season. In the regular season. Extra. Yeah. So, so now they you're got overcoming them in the mental battles, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, seriously. Big time. That's awesome. Big upset. Well yeah. done. And you are also playing volleyball, though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But water polo is your main thing. Are mm -hmm. you going to try to go to college for both or volleyball? Are they, They're not the same season. Would you be able to do both in college? Um, I haven't even really considered that as an option, but oh. I feel like... I feel like water polo is the is the sport that I want to lock into. Okay. Yeah, for All sure. Right. So volleyball um, is just kind of a fun thing that yeah, you Yeah, yeah. I mean, most mostly for me it's just some some good fun with good people and good friends and I have a lot of fun with the sport like athletically as well, but yeah. it's just a good mental break and yeah. it's a lot of fun to even just the athleticism side of it, I feel mm -hmm. like being able to jump and feel super like mobile and not like held down by water, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. helps a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I do have to say, before we keep going on with, with your college dreams and stuff, um, I do have to thank you um, for a very special video that I now have of my son and me playing Pepper in my driveway. Um, and it was because of you. Um, I remember it was probably a couple years ago. I think you were a freshman. You were very yeah. new at yeah. volleyball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, my high school team that I was coaching at the time, which was my first year ever coaching boys. I've coached for 18 plus years, but I've wow. never coached a boys team. So this is my first go at it. And I took these, these boys to a tournament that you were in and mm -hmm. my team was refing your team. And so I'm watching this team and I didn't know who you were at the time. I was just watching your guys' team like, man, they're, they're pretty good. I wish, I wish we had some <laughs> motivation like that um, or some height like that. That would be helpful too. Um, can't always choose what you get, but that, that is what we get. Um, and my son comes in with this handful of snacks and he, I had to bring him because his dad was working and all that. Yeah. Um, so my son comes in behind me and he stops and he goes, mom, do you think I'm gonna look like that? And I was like, Actually, son, now that you mention it, yes, you're probably going to look a lot like that. You know, lanky, all arms and legs, just tall and gangly <laughs> and athletic and blonde hair. And, <laughs> and yeah, that's probably going to. So we looked across the net and saw you and went, man, this this I tried to put Lakin's face on you and I just started to cry like this is my future. And then I looked across the gym <laughs> and saw him sitting across, uh, over against the wall. And I went over to say hello. And I'm like, what are you doing here? Are you coaching? And he's like, no, my, my son's playing. I went. Of course, wow. that would be your son. So after that, when that match was over, when the day was over, loaded up the kid in the back seat, and he's in the back seat, and he goes, "How tall do you think Harper is?" And I was like, "Well, he's, he's probably about you know six five or six six now. He's he's a, well, how old is he? Well, he's he's very young. This is his first year playing volleyball, and he's pretty good, huh? Yeah, he's pretty good." And then we went to the store, and we're cruising up and down the grocery aisles, and he's jumping up trying to touch the top rack. And he's like, how high do you think t Harper touches? And I'm like, the whole car ride, the entire day was like a Harper fan fest. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, my son has a small boy crush on Harper. <laughs> but when we got home for like the next week, I was out in my driveway playing. He asked me to pepper with him. And that was the first time he had ever like engaged in volleyball. And he did that with me yeah. as his mom. So I was like, my cup was just full. Oh wow! And awesome. I have you to thank for that. Um, so you know, he doesn't. He hasn't chosen volleyball yet. He's mm -hmm. playing soccer right now, but because of that experience, it's a dual thing. Like it has a special memory for me. Yeah, it's gotten a, totally. a, a breach of sport introduction for him. And you know that anybody could be watching you at any time, no matter how old you are or how good or how bad or how, like yeah. you guys get people's attention and you have to be aware that small people are watching everything that you yeah. do. Um, and you're a big influence on people, even though you don't think that, you know, if you're a freshman, you don't think that you've earned the right yet to be mm -hmm. awesome. You don't have any celebrity or anything to like, you know, be proud of. Um, people are watching. 
So that was, anyway, so thank, awesome. thank well, you for that. Yeah. How amazing that the universe connected all yeah. that though too. Like, I know. Like you, that could have been anybody, right? It, it happened to be been. my son and you it knew happen- me and I like, know. and it was like the, the, one of the first tournaments that I ever went to, one of his first tournaments yeah. he ever played Seriously. on. Yeah. Yep. That's pretty it's, cool. The universe saying what, like the universe is saying something there. Like we were meant to be here today. <laughs> I, <laughs> I do think it's odd though. Like of all of our journeys and throughout, for, throughout, like just life happening. Like yeah. I ended up back in Sacramento, which is where I'm from. I don't know yeah. what your excuse is for being in Sacramento. Harper's but... mom's from Sacramento. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's, yeah. yeah. It's always, it's always the wife. Come on. It's always the family. <laughs> the this, family. This is, this is 100% true. Yes. Uh, um, so you're now looking at colleges um, mm-hmm. for water polo. Um, what are you kind of looking for in a college? Like, you, are you looking for big places, small places, ac- super academic places? Like, what are you kind of into? Um, well, I, th- I still think I'm, like, really early on mm-hmm. in my process, but um, I think I want to go to, like, a bigger school and just kind of get out of, uh, just see new things, you know, have a new experience, have a new, get a little away from home, um, just meet meet new people, and that's coming into big big play for my college experience. Mm-hmm. I've thought about maybe going East Coast or yeah. farther away. I mean, most, uh, a lot of big water pool schools are down in, the, the, the SoCal. So okay. That too. Yeah, yeah. I do know that when I, I went to Pacific, which is only an hour from my house, and I was very worried about, you know, being too close to home and mom and dad just dropping by yeah. all of a sudden, which they don't do. Um, so even if you end up engaging with a school that happens to be closer to mm-hmm. Sacramento than you thought, um, you know, some, just being out of the house, being out of mom and dad's care, yeah. Is a, you're gonna have your own experience yeah, absolutely. anyway. Um, so you know, even being 15 or 20 minutes away could feel like you're three hours away because um, you're That's gonna have to you're gonna have your own life and stuff. Yeah. Um, are you gonna let? Well, let me stop you there. Oh, okay. Addie. Okay. All right. Because Addie used to be the coach at UC mom. Davis, and I'd be super stoked if Harper stayed closer. <laughs> <laughs> Davis, you hear that? Davis, did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, that's that's plenty far away though, right? It's for Sacramento plenty, kids, it's plenty far away. Yeah. That causeway can be super long. I mean, it's a lot hard, you know. It's a lot harder to fly to New York or Boston <laughs> to go to Harvard or something. This, but this is but true. It, they, hey, at the end of the day, you know, as parents, even former athletes, it's always their choice. That's like, what I, I was going to ask. I want, like, yeah. Are you gonna? Do you want dad and? you know, your family to help influence your decision? Or are you like, I'm on my own road, I'm paving my own way? No, I absolutely want their, uh, de- like, real influence on this. I mean, financially, they're going to be a big part of it, too. So, mm-hmm. I mean, if they don't take any any consideration, like, that's just a silly, silly thing for them. But um, I do have kind of a vision for where I want to go. And I think that I'm, I'm blessed with parents that are just going to let me take the lead in, on that step, too. And Sure. Really, as, as he just said, you know, they're going to want me to go where I want to go yeah, and support me. Well, and I think part of it, it, at least from my journey, and you, I mean, it'd be great to hear. I know you had a great coach in college, right? I and did. That, and that, that was a big part of why you guys were so successful. Like mm-hmm. my college, my one college mistake was I didn't quite get the coaches that, that jived with me and the program in that period of time. Um, and there were some great college coaches that I missed out on that ended up coaching me later in life. Perfect example is we talked about BYU earlier. Mm-hmm. So Carl McGowan was the longtime BYU coach. Mm-hmm. I actually came, Carl McGowan, um, shout out to the McGowan family, who's an amazing family. Of but course. Carl passed away, I don't, I don't know, five or seven years ago. He was one of the most influential coaches in my career. But not until I got to the national team, got and it. he came back. Yeah. But he had such an impact on a, a world of volleyball players that came through BYU's program. Mm-hmm. Similarly, Marv Dumphy at Pepperdine, um, and Al Skates at UCLA. Mm-hmm. So those are just like the top three in my head of coaches that later on, even though I didn't go to their school, I yeah. had such a great connection with. Yeah. And they had such amazing impacts on my career in my professional life and my Olympic journey That's a good versus point. like college. So I always think like you can really got to have like a tight bond and belief in your coach and where they're going to take you through four to five years of your life yeah. and make sure they get the most out of you, but also um, 
you know, support your dreams of like whatever those next step is, you yeah. know, it yeah, could yeah. be just like, I want to be the best play, player in college by my junior year, or I want to actually go to the Olympics or have a shot to play on the USA team, whatever that is. I like that was cultivated. That is still not pervasive in every coach across every college. Right. Right. 100%, like yes. there's still special coaches that stand out at yeah. different universities in every sport. So I, I, I just want to encourage Harper to really have a connection with a coach that wherever he goes, so that they, they can get the most out of him and he can get the most out of himself. Yeah, 100%. That is great. That is a great point. And connections are super important. Um, and I've, I wanted to also kind of ask you, I'm sure you get comments, like comparison comments, like teen, mm-hmm. other teenagers, teammates saying, you know, oh, you know, your dad's a gold medalist, yeah, and, you know, yeah. your your stepmom is a bronze medalist, synchronized swimmer. Like your your household is probably pretty competitive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure family people people may, yeah family game night gets a little rough sometimes. <laughs> um, pieces go flying, game boards are shredded, <laughs> like screaming, screaming and kicking. Uh, yeah. No, there's none of that. I would love to be a fly on your wall. <laughs> we just do puzzles together now. Puzzles. Yeah, it's limited to puzzles. Uh, Less Monopoly's invasive things. Banned. <laughs> no, <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah, but I'm sure you get some comments about, yeah, um, you know, oh, your your dad is so good. Like, you must be good. Also, does do comments like that? Um, do they make you um, proud, or do they put pressure on you, or do they not affect you at all? When you um, hear those, I think it's it's a mixture of both. Like, it makes me proud, and it makes me like know that I'm capable. I feel mm-hmm. like, like even just hearing about his journey, you know, he's had so much troubles, you know, in his life mm-hmm. with with sports and so much adversity and he's like got over that. So that really helps me out in like harder moments. Mm-hmm. But like, I think a big reason why I fell in love so much with water polo too is that like, and didn't choose to go a bigger volleyball route is that pressure is that like, oh, is he gonna live up? I don't wanna follow in the exact same yeah, footsteps. You 100%, know? yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so water polo kind of became your thing. Mm-hmm. Volleyball became his, even though volleyball is part of yours and water polo is part of yours. Totally. Yeah. But you took off in volleyball and you're taking off in in water polo, and that's going to be your going to be your jam. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Well, it sounds like you're doing a a, a great job parenting and and guiding and helping navigate. It must make you feel really good that even though we had a rough go in college and kind of your route wasn't exactly ideal at the young ages but that's it's really showing up now um because he's a very thoughtful well you know versed you know young man and going through the process like that's all been worth it for you yeah i mean it's um yeah i mean you put it perfectly like you want you want your your kids to to get the most out of themselves and like the thing I always preach is is and this isn't just for him but like anybody that I coach or anything is like if you're going to put time into something Mm -hmm. try to be the best that you you can possibly be right whatever that is even if it's not sports like you're going to put time into something try to be excellent at it yeah and and like make use of that time because time is such a valuable commodity to all of us like if you're playing a sport and you're not really kind of all in on it and you're not really like really going for it like spend your time on something that you're going to put a ton of time into. Mm-hmm. But if you're all in on that sport, like you should be doing everything you possibly can to be the best at it yeah. and push your limits because that's where growth comes in. Right. And For that's sure. where like excellence and great, you know, what I like to tell kids is like, you want to have those sports moments cause they live with you for the rest of your life. And that only comes from trying to be the best. Uh-huh you know, or being the on the best team, right? Yeah. Around a group of guys that's the best. Like yeah. you and I have been lucky that we've had some amazing sports memories, right? Yeah. Oh, for sure, absolutely. And, and I just feel like there's sometimes where parents go a little bit astray with kids to, in today's age is like, they're more focused on the end goal, which is like trying to get my kid to college or trying to get, um, you know, them, them in, you know, in a position to start on their club mm-hmm. team or whatever mm-hmm. versus like, no, go through the tough sparts, but have your kid be all in so they can get through anything yeah. and come out on the other side and have these great athletic moments where they're like, that's where it kind of clicks for them. Like yeah. Harper had that this year when he won the championship, right? Uh-huh. Like then you want more of that. 
Yeah. You absolutely. know, or you had that in Junior Olympics and, you know, quite frankly, could have that again in volleyball this season for our high school team. Like mm -hmm. winning is addictive mm -hmm. and it only comes with like a full on commitment to the time you're putting in. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a great comment. And that actually kind of breached a couple of the questions that I had kind of worked in here was, <laughs> are, do you feel that kids today as a coach, putting your coach hat on now, um, do you feel like kids today that you coach or Harper's age players or Finn's age players are getting out of youth sports what we got out of it, which is, you know, that, that, you know, sense of teamwork and working for, working through hard things like maybe not agreeing with your coach all the time, um, coaches that you love, coaches that you hate, um, and accountability, uh, responsibility, kind of a sense of right and wrong and having those best memories surface through the work and through the effort and being all in. Do you think that kids are getting that or is that something that you worry about, them not getting out of it what we got out of it? I definitely worry about it. Um, and I do see it quite a bit, but I think the thing that affects that more where our society has gone as a sports culture and parenting and where we can kind of go a little bit off the rails is we want to make judgments on kids at a very young age for mm -hmm. what kind of athlete they're going to be. Mm -hmm. And we, we try to predict too early. Like I had a parent tell me recently, like their, their 13 and under kid wasn't going to play volleyball in college. And I'm like, how do you know that? <laughs> yeah. He's 13 and under. Like, that's yeah. crazy to me that you would even think that. Mm -hmm. Like, the system we set up is trying to predict who's going to be able to make the next level so early now mm -hmm. that, like, kids feel like they have to pr – if they're not having success right away, if they lose motivation, then they're not all in, yes, right? Yes, yeah. Versus, yes. like – Versus, you know, quite frankly, the European system is different because they identify kids with talent and then they kind of pair them up with the professional teams. And like when I was in Turkey, there were like one or two 17 and 18 year olds playing with our professional team that was full of like 28 and 29 year old guys and they were getting beat up. Yeah. Right. And they were like getting their licks in and they weren't they weren't hanging tough and they had to like work for time on the court side, sort of like we did on the national team. Right. Mm -hmm. And like kind of work your way through the process. Good, yep. But what you knew is that those same kids when that were 17, 18, 19 in a couple of years when they're early 20s, 22, 23, some of them are like the best players in Turkey now. Mm. Right, because they just Cause they went like because they went through it, and they also had the time to get to a point. Yeah. Like, I don't know about you, but like, I don't think there's a volleyball player, a men's volleyball player in the world that I've ever known that was like gr the greatest player at 18. Like, it just doesn't happen. Like, it takes time to get yeah. there, and it takes the adversity and the reps. So, yeah. don't try to decide that when your kid's 15 or 16 years old. Yeah, yeah. like keep encouraging them to keep at it and keep encouraging them to you like go all in with their time and their energy, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and the te teach all the skills and let them kind of develop everything. Totally. Kind of how, because there was no Libro position, there was no, yeah. you know, said the rules were different of a game. And, you know, if you pigeonhole yourself into thinking like, I'm 6'1", I'm gonna be a middle, that's a great place to start. But if I end up not being an Olympic level middle and they want me to be a passer, then heck, I can pass, and I'm gonna I'm gonna outpass everybody that there is. You know, if uh, yeah. so, if you are taken out of goal, you've spent most of your time. You love being a goalie, and goalie mm -hmm. is like your thing. Yeah. Um, if somebody says, "Hey, we don't want you. We identify you as a as a goalie, and you're the best one out there," but for this tournament, we want you to be a shooter. Yeah. Can you do that? Yeah, I I, I believe that like. It's like a, a game awareness, you know? Like it's it's a translation of like, it's not the, the person who's played it the longest, it's the person who's put their mind in playing it the longest, you yeah. know? Like paying attention, being super aware in practice, like picking up little small things from, from different players, you know? Game IQ. Game IQ, exactly, yeah. yes, absolutely. So I, I mean, I think it would take a, a learning curve, but I could do it easily. Brilliant, I love that, I love that. There's so many players that I that I coach, I don't know how many players you've coached that, or parents that say, you know, well, she, he plays, you know, opposite for school, but he plays um, outside for club, we only wanna play outside. And yeah. then you kind of shortchange yourself yeah. into yeah. this mindset that you can only do this yeah. because you've been told that you should only do that. 
Well, and it's the same thing with, with playing different sports, right? Tr- yes, that You too. should only play water polo year-round 100%. And it's like, well, is that really the right thing to do with kids when they're, like, developing yeah. motor yeah. skills? Yeah, and, like, cross-training yeah. is really important. And, like, having a mental break. Like, I always tell Harper, the reason I was a three-sport athlete is because I wanted to look forward to, like, that new challenge mm-hmm. of relearning how to shoot a basketball or get rebounds and then relearning how to – passive volleyball was it the best thing did it mean I advanced as quick as I could have maybe maybe not Mm -hmm. but like at the end of the day I knew it was like a good place for my brain to like be challenged and mentally to have like to not get burnt out on the one sport that I was playing so I think a lot of kids and a lot of parents get sort of tricked into like going all in on a one sport that their kids are showing promise at at a at a young age too, and you know this because you were on the women's volleyball side. Like girls volleyball is huge from a very young age, mm-hmm. very very young age, and it's hard. I coach eight year olds. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah. I mean, it's hard. Like when you get down that path to say like, well, she's playing soccer too because there's conflicts and it's schedule management. Mm-hmm. But I would always, you know, I always try to encourage my kid like if like manage through the conflict on the schedule because it's worth the mental challenge yeah. but also worth the mental break from just playing in burnout yeah burnout that happens from mm-hmm. one sport yeah, I, um mm-hmm. and the other thing i wanted to say addy just real quick is you know i know you know on your side and all your experience like I, at least i had this experience a lot of the kids that were like really successful and like deemed as like the next big volleyball players when i was growing up mm-hmm. didn't act, didn't typically make it you mm-hmm. know past into the later stages it was actually the guys like Tom Hoff or Riley Salomon or guys that were like had to really work all through high school to earn it and then like developed a work ethic they weren't like the most talented players or the most highlighted players in college right like they developed a skill and a work ethic skill that like catapulted them to becoming an Olympic gold medalist versus like being like the chosen one from a young age out of high school so my point in reminding you about that because I know you've had players like that on your national team it's like don't always count yourself out and don't always think that the person that seems like in high school to be the best is going to be the best because they right. like there's a lot of things that happen between that and the later stages. Absolutely. And that's not even including like injury, taking someone injury. out and they get like yeah. all, all kinds of stuff could happen. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but you, ju- you hit on something and this was one of my like end of podcast questions because I was like dying to ask this question um, is, you know, you touched on it with people that are really, really good at something or become really successful at something or, or make it, um, champions are a little bit unbalanced people. Like we are, we're all in, like we, we spend so much time making all of our decisions to become the best at what we do. And whether that's painting or if it's, you know, being the best musician or the best Mm -hmm. volleyball player, best water polo player, whatever it is, you have to have that all in mentality where you kind of put some of these other balanced things that that people say that balance you out, like, um, you know, faith, family, friends, social life, going to football games, going, you know, doing all these other things that make people balanced. Champions often push those things to the side sometimes yeah. to get where they're going, but that helps make them successful. Um, so for the message that some kids are getting of, you know, well, we want you, we want to prepare you to be done with sports. And, you know, when you're finished, you have to have kind of a balanced life. So we need you to do, um, to be good at academics, good, you know, socially, um, we have to be have more balance. What what do you tell? Do you think we're confusing kids and shorting them from being as great as they could be by telling them that they have to spend equal amounts of time on all these balanced things when we know that there's something a little bit imbalanced about champions? That's a good question. I mean, to me, like if I'm if I'm self reflecting, like there were times I questioned whether volleyball was like the end all be all in my life. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's okay to question your commitment to something that's hard. That's really challenging and hard. Yeah. I think where the difference lies is, um, you know, in today's like modern athlete, the kids we coach Addie, like, like they do have to really think about their mind and their, 
like attitude and how that manifests in the, to what they play sports in. So, mm-hmm. so some balance is I think really important, but at the same time, like it goes back to what I said earlier about being all in at the same time, like this is a great family kid. Like he loves his family. Like, sure. He loves yeah, his, yeah. like th- that is his support network. Um, and maybe, yeah, he has to give up a little bit more socially, right. Or yeah. uh-huh. like not go out or make some, make some commitments to not be as available to, to people socially. You mm-hmm. and I had to do the same thing. I mean, how many, how many weddings of good friends from college did you miss? Like I did when you were overseas. Like I it's, missed prom. Yeah. Like <laughs> for a tournament. Yeah. Like we, that's just part of the commitment that mm-hmm. you get there and you realize looking back, like, I don't remember the prom I missed or the, the, um, the wedding I missed. I, I remember what I achieved in my sport by going all in. Yeah. 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 So, and do you feel that? Do you, do you feel I like mean, you're all in or do you feel pretty balanced? Like, what do you, what do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, it's literally funny that you say that about like school events. Cause last night, um, all my friends were trying to get me to go to go to this basketball game right after practice and I said, "Nah, I can't. I have to do I have to do schoolwork. Like I have to get some stuff done. Like mm-hmm. I got to clear my mind. Like I have to stretch. I have to get a good night's rest. Like I know I'm not going to do that." Mm-hmm. Of course, the game turns out to be a crazy buzzer beater win that oh. everyone's talking about the next day. Yeah. You know, um but it's something you have to go through and it happens and it's just like I feel better. Like I wouldn't I I'm not I'm upset a little bit that it was a great game, but I'm I'm happy with the choice I made. I, I got a good night's rest and I got all my schoolwork. I feel I feel really good. He's so much more day. disciplined than we were in he, high school. Man, it's I, I threw I some <laughs> massive fits because <laughs> I, I couldn't go to prom and all my, all my friends were leaving tournaments early to I go know. get their nails done and their hair like all. Sometimes I wonder if he's related to me. I didn't even go so to any homecoming. It's so more sensible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you know. I, I I look I I'm jealous when people um, have you know what we've been around we've been exposed to the best athletes in the world mm-hmm. and now we have the, the the generosity of having a great community here where we mm-hmm. live and a good sports culture with people to support sports and support academics and like mm-hmm. we're super lucky at this point in time in our lives to be able to talk together and and do this stuff and for sure. I don't know. I mean, I just, I don't know where I found this kid. Like, he's way more sensible. <laughs> found him in the hospital, <laughs> in your arms, in a, in a towel. You made him. <laughs> that's right. You made him. Uh, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, so the, the only other thing that I kind of wanted to hit on was kind of the generation gap and, and coaching and, um, and kind of feeling like, you know, we had some great coaches. Like we, you've had some okay coaches. We've all had coaches that we love or don't love, that we connect with, don't connect with. Um, I've been very fortunate that, you know, in my, in my coaching road, I don't have the same college experience and club experience that you've had because yeah. all of my coaches have been legends. I played, uh. you know, I had Pam Whitpin here who was a legend in Sacramento area for girls volleyball. Um, even my club coaches, I had Debbie Kohlberg for yeah, two years, yeah. who was one of the most successful yeah. volleyball Long-time coaches for a women coach. games at yeah. Sac State for 36 years. Yep. Um, you know, even, you know, Sharon Clark, who's now at Butler, uh, had her, um, from, I went, had John Dunning and Janie McHugh. Yep. And then yep. from there I went on a pro tour with Mary Wise and John. Oh, wow. And then I played for Ari. I played for yep. Toshi and Kevin, yeah. um, Tori Alexanderson. Like I, I have had some like legendary, epically awesome human beings as coaches. So I've haven't had a bad experience in coaching. Have you had any coaches that you've had like run-ins with and the run-in has been because of like a generational gap thing where um the coach is kind of old school mentality i want you to do this there's punishments and consequences and things that are hard and you kind of not reject it but um you kind of there's pushback from you or any of your teammates have you seen that at all i mean it's funny that you guys say like i'm a perfect kid because i mean my coach for high school was like a, a lover to death, but she's a very difficult person, okay. very difficult coach, super, super generational gap that you're talking about. I mm-hmm. mean, 
like uh, our our top players have been kicked out of practice. I've been kicked out of practice multiple okay. times. That's like, what I'm talking about. Yeah, like that stuff. Like it's real. Like punishments. Like don't 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 talk back. You know, mm-hmm. like kind of don't question is like kind of a mentality too. And and yeah. she's an amazing coach. No hate. Yeah, like, yeah. N- n- absolutely. Like I've learned so much from her and that style is super like it's team building you know to like it's kind of good to say like oh like god i hate this coach like but it's building you know like we're going through these punishments together yeah, yeah. as a team and it's like kind of building our dynamic of oh we got through this then we can get through this big game you know like together yeah. what's the protocol like when when say a teammate gets kicked out of practice um, or say you get kicked out of practice for any reason. I'm sure you've never been kicked out of practice, but maybe no, threatened to be kicked out of practice. Um, how, what's, what do you guys do in, with a coach like that? Like, how do you address that? Do you go to the coach's office? Like, what do you do to, so- to problem solve? Um, I mean, for me, it's just like the next day, like it's a new, it's a new thing. She's really good about like, I mean, I think it's a temper thing too. Like we both, like water polo is an aggressive sport. It's you're fighting. You're fighting people literally, mm-hmm. and like tempers get high. And then when you come back the next day, it's definitely different. And they're just like, we're trying to get over these challenges. Oh, like where? How did we? How did we hit this miss road? Like, most of the times, just small like miscommunication errors. And like late at night, you know, p- tempers are high. Yeah. Um, so that like next day you come in, you say, hey, I'm sorry for my outburst, coach. Like it won't happen again. Like hope we can work through this and you know it goes from there it's it's pretty simple it's the next day like that's mature yeah absolutely that's mature i see a lot of um i i, I read a lot of comments on facebook which i probably shouldn't do um but i'm in coaching threads and all kinds of part of coaching pages and and i see parents come on and and vent about you know my kid was kicked out of practice and you know the coach is um, it was aggressive and unnecessary and, and, and the kid's view of the coach then is, is changed and it changes the connection between the player and the coach when it should just be the player and the coach. Um, but at what, have you experienced that as a coach? Like what, where is the line between, um, what you can handle just player to coach and then when the, when does the parent get involved or the AD get involved or... Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I mean, I've been pretty fortunate, like, in having coached really, really good kids and good families that I know their intentions are always in the right place. Mm. But, um, you know, typical to any team in sport, like, you'll have certain situations where you have to discipline or you have to call someone out. Mm-hmm. An example, not to name names, but, like, last year, one of my, one of my kids on my team was getting heckled all game at an opposing match, and... Uh, um, this crowd was pretty rough on us and then we won the match and he, he, he flipped off the crowd on the way out of the gym, like sort of just like, yeah. and he knew right away that he messed up by doing it. But the AD came over and talked to me about it. The player did that. The player did that to the stands and the AD of the closing stands saw it and came over and told me like, Hey, Mm -hmm. one of your players just flipped off the whole crowd. Mm -hmm. And so, like, he made a mistake. Like, kids are humans, too, Mm -hmm. and, like, they can make mistakes. I think Harper, you know, he's been kicked out of practice once, but it wasn't anything, like, egregious or something that we can't, like, figure out and talk through. Lessons. They're just life lessons that we need to resolve. So I think what what it kind of drives home the point to me that, you know, part of a coach's role, a good coach's role, is to love and to get the the player a connection with the player Mm -hmm. and that's where i think old school difference for new school is like i actually want to get to know my players and understand where they're coming from and show them a little bit of love before Mm -hmm. i just just hammer them you Mm -hmm. know because only hammering a player and you you said yourself you were lucky i'm sure you didn't have a coach that was just hammering you i've had some coaches that were really, really aggressive. Uh, but I was tougher. I was raised to be a little bit tougher mentally. But did they show you normal. any personal connection? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Absolutely. there's the, the back there's the balance. So I've had coaches that were only aggressive. Got it. And didn't, like, care about anything else. That's why I left SC. Like, that particular coach mm-hmm. showed no love to anybody. He was just old school. Mm-hmm. He just punished. 
He just told you how bad you were. Mm-hmm. So like that, that kind of borders on like that, that doesn't work anymore. And I don't think it worked back then with me, but it doesn't work with kids today because ultimately like they're looking up to us as an example for how to treat people. Totally, right. Totally. And like how you treat people is with balance. Like I'm, I mean, Harpo will be the first one to say, like, I've gotten upset at our team because of effort, or I've called them out in yeah. practices on the volleyball Absolutely. court when they're not giving their all or they're messing around. Mm-hmm. But I also like care about them and, and try to have that balance and try to talk to kids individually and make yeah. sure I'm like, not, it's not just performance based, right? Yeah. It's and a that, little bit that kind of keeps the parents at bay and all the and players it, and it's at bay not just, and it balances everybody yeah, out. Yeah, and it's not just winning either, right? right. Like, like that's but the it other thing. It can't be all about winning because only one team ever wins. That's what I'm saying. Somebody it's has like to lose. There's the, other, there's the other side of the coin, which is like if we're not winning, we're not like getting something out of sports, which is silly too, right? Yeah, like there's ridiculous. been tons of teams that I've lost a ton on, even with all of our success on the higher levels. Like there's tons of teams that I've had – really tough struggled years Mm -hmm. professionally in college where it was like okay what am I going to do about this Mm -hmm. you know how can I impact it better how can I get us over the hump or Mm -hmm. like Harper did this year with his water polo team like they weren't like the best team in the whole section for sure like Mm -hmm. they had to get over some adversity to to be able to pull off that that final game and and I, I think that's the beautiful thing about sports is like you know the coach the coach player interaction is really really critical but it's also like understanding that that things are a little bit bigger than just winning yeah well some of, I, I was talking to somebody um a while back and they said they made a beautiful comment about how you know you guys are are competing you're put on the court or the in the water um to compete but as a coach like we're competing too like yeah. we're trying to also yeah. compete yeah um, parents, I'm sure, in some way are also competing, but they have lack of control yeah. of the outcome. So they compete differently than we do because we have more control over the result. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, with with those things kind of flaring, um, as long you can probably get away with coaching with a little bit of an ego, like, you know, I, I want to win because you guys are a reflection of me, but I also want you to win because I want you to win. I want you to win for you. I want you to yeah. have the experience yeah. of you winning. And if we don't, it's okay. Um, do you ever have issues with, with, you know, think if, if the team loses, it's, um, it's kind of on you, like it, it's a reflection of you or? Not, not no? at this level. I think if I was coaching, potentially if I had, you know, later in my life or whatever, if I was coaching at a higher level, maybe Mm -hmm. more so Mm -hmm. because there's so much like preparation that goes at a higher level coaching, right? It's like you you did it because you were at UC Davis. Like, you know, the next level of coaching that it's a full-time profession. It's not volunteering at a high school and coaching after your day job, right? Like that's like full video analysis, recruiting, it's all like the time. all the time you're always on. And mm-hmm. so I think I think at that level, I would feel some responsibility. But at this level, um, it's really all about the kids. Sure. And I look at coaching as my way to give back to my community more than anything and like to impart some of my knowledge and some of my like motivation to like affect change, positive change on these kids as yeah. community service. So yeah. it's not like like when you kind of detach from the outcome of winning and losing and it's more and and the ego that I may have because I've had success I I mean I have even told the kids too like I don't have anything to prove yeah like our our time's done our time like I've already retired you know like I'm good like I'm good so like that's where like I can be okay with losing to a bad team as long as we gave effort and like as long as the the characteristics of winning are there yeah um, and I love I love the servant part of that. Tony Dungy yeah. has written some fantastic books. I'm totally. a huge fan of Tony Dungy, and he's written his series of books, Servant Leader. Yeah, yeah, I read that oh, book too. God, totally. Oh, he he's one yeah. of my favorites. Yeah, and, and I think that, like, if there were more coaches in the community, and I'm not saying there, there's some amazing coaches in every community, but if there were more, if that was more pervasive, mm-hmm. I think the impact on kids and the less challenges we'd have with coaches and parents or your kids with coaches, like, you know, that connection, that servant attitude is really important versus the actual ego, which is like, well, I'm Gabe Gardner. 
I was successful, so our team should win everything. Yeah. You're like, and why aren't you guys playing enough? You suck. You suck. Like, get better. Like, yeah. that's not, that's not a, a good place to be. Yeah. No, it's not. And I, th- I think there's a little piece of newer coaches that are fresh coming out of playing that do feel yeah. a little bit of that. Like, I know I felt a little bit of that when I was first starting to coach and get my coaching legs on um, and coming out, trying to detach from being a player and stepping into a coaching role, there is a little bit of that overlay. Totally. And we totally. have to, you know, like maybe Carl McGowan types, yeah. like you have to, you may not have been awesome for him at BYU, but he was awesome yeah. later on in yeah. life. And coaches have to grow also. Totally. Um, which is which is a big thing. Um, do you, could just a couple final questions. Um, do you feel like he's as good of a dad at home, like the, as he is, a coach does do the coaching and the parenting overlap at home oh abs- absolutely yeah, yeah i feel like i mean uh the balance is a big part of it i mean being able to be super happy for your your kid and like very um just outgoing like mm-hmm. i feel like it's different with a coach and a parent because it's like obviously there's like a way more personal connection mm-hmm. but like the balance between like oh like punishment and fun you know yeah going out like having a connection where you can tell your kid to go have fun with their friends yeah. and being able to be like hey like you need to stay like I like recommend you really need to stay home this weekend like I know there's finals coming up you have an SAT blank blank like whatever happens that weekend like we you need to stay home like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that trust between the two right and that's like kind of respect for like a coach you know mm-hmm. oh like we have a big game it's homecoming this weekend, don't do anything stupid, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, or it's s- stuff like that. It's like, it's a game night, you know? Don't mm-hmm. stay up late, sleep, like that trust, like you can't always be there in that room um, yeah. controlling them. Yeah. So you have to have that that relationship of trust. So do you have very many rules at home from the parental figures in, in the house? Do you have like any social media rules or any, or are they just, are you mature enough now, having gone through it, um, that y- that they just make recommendations and then you weigh the recommendations? Is it an open communication type of thing, or is it like a you c- if you don't get a three point five then or higher, then you can't play in this tournament this weekend? Uh, yeah, it's, I mean it's absolutely like it's it's a mix between that. I would say um, it's open communication if you prove it. You know, like you can go have fun with your friends if you n- can keep that that 3.5 sure you know like and if it's and if you're struggling then we need to scale it back and I need to take a bigger influence got it you know okay so that trust I feel like comes with kind of a performance you know gotcha Um, now what are some of your every kid has um, things that they feel that their parent or other any parents when they're watching your uh, matches or meets um, that definitely help support them. Um, what are some things that you've seen parents do that, that you know mm-hmm. um, that help support you, that make you better? Um, well, I just think personally for me, one of like, even just in general, one of my best moments as like a father-son connection is just those those pre-game talks. Pre-game talks, okay. Yeah, yeah. like getting my mind ready um, the mindset aspect of it, hearing it from a of a from a bigger athlete that's cool. taking on bigger challenges, but just just knowing like they're there to support you and they're they don't they don't care about the outcome, but here's like I know you can do this. Yeah. I believe in you. Like yeah. those pre going into the game is really is a big deal to that's me. That's important. And one on the flip side of that, what are some parenting icks that you're like, Ugh, Dad, stop it. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me think. Uh, I feel like yelling out at the crowd, like, like loudly is like pretty, uh, pretty funny sometimes. I mean, yeah. like parents definitely get involved with the refs oh, a I lot. Know. Um, and that's kind of just gross to me, especially when it's, uh, it's kind of funny when they don't know what they're talking about too. Yeah. That's probably the best part. <laughs> He's not talking about me. Yeah. No, no, no. I, no I, I caught that. I caught that. I caught the general <laughs> yeah. back there yeah. for sure. But yeah. that's, that's I try to. I honestly like the, it, he brings up a good point though. Like even me as a former high level athlete, like I couldn't believe how 
younger parents yelling at younger soccer refs. And my one of my younger sons was actually a ref for like eight and under soccer, and he oh, got yelled at by parents. And it's like I can only imagine you walking up at six yeah. ten going, "Yo, yeah, like what? It, like <laughs> come on, down. like tone it down. This is a kids' youth soccer game. Like it, and yeah. it's rec soccer. Like chill. Like yeah. so that that part of our culture and society is is a little too serious right now, and it's it's unfortunate, but. I do think that, um, you know, we really, pr- I mean, this is funny because it's vol- like, let's talk volleyball for a second. Let's. Water polo is hugely influenced by referee decisions. Wa- volleyball, in comparison, not very much influence. Okay. So it's pretty, it's like the difference in sports. Like you can, you can get really f- frustrated with refereeing and water polo yeah, very quickly because they're mm-hmm. actually ejecting guys out of the game for fouls and making them leave the pool and then, and then you're at well, a disadvantage. Well, they're probably making some of those calls that we can't see because they're yes. in the water. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's like super, it. there's a lot of gray area, room for error. And then the bigger thing is when you get kicked out, you only have three chances at that and then you're out of the game. Yeah. So I've had... Going back to that that uh, that Davis game, some of those games have been decided on like our best player got kicked out of the game because oh, yeah. of referee decisions. Yeah, oh, okay. you know things have happened. I mean, like it's serious. I mean, oh. volleyball is, is serious with the ref too, but like it's but point it's, by point. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, and then you can always come different. back, and you're never gonna get like remove a player off the court. Yeah. Like, you know, maybe they miss a touch call or they come call a bad double, but it's yeah. like, okay, we can we can get by that one point. Yeah. Like in water polo, it's like, no, they eject someone out and then they have a huge advantage to score. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it it's okay. funny, like that's interesting. Yeah, and and it's um but still like even more so reason to like preach respect for referees, respect like sportsmanship. Absolutely. Like that's still a, a very important lesson in mm-hmm. this day and age. It's like the, you're never even we like one of my soft spots is is coaching and water polo was just like getting too into the game a little bit with the referees because I saw what an influence it had and then you realize that that actually makes the refs want to call worse against yeah. you right uh-huh. and we've seen that in volleyball too mm-hmm. like Absolutely. players that argue with the ref and the touches and stuff it's like mm-hmm. no they they do remember that and you don't get calls later on when it matters so like just right. stop that yeah like it just let's doesn't just, help let's so. just stop. So the final, I guess the final thing what we'll end on, um, since I have these uh, pictures up, there were these were kind of game things, and we just touched on it a little bit. Um, our rules um, in volleyball um, this year, um, one of the rule changes that they're making, I think for the women's game for sure, um, but I don't know if it'll change for the men, um, is they're gonna stop calling doubles oh, on really? sec on second contacts. Um, they've done it already for first contact. You can double a first yeah, contact, yeah, yeah. but then that's been in place for several years now. We've all adjusted to that. Um, but they're going to not – referees oh, the, aren't going to call doubles on sets either on a second like, contact. They'll, like, call, <laughs> they'll call it on the third one. You can't double on the way over the net. Uh, um, tell me, what do you what do you guys think about that? Like, how is that going to change the game when we stop calling doubles on a set? I mean, as long as – like. I kind of agree with. I just got back from a fourteen and under tournament, and there were refs calling doubles on fourteen and thirteen year olds. Like right, I, but they're young. They don't really know how to set yet. They so don't I, really I know. Give, how to, that's I get what, giving them a little bit of grace, but how about like at the college? No, no, level? no. They were sorry. I said they weren't calling it. I said they were. Oh, they were. I, should, calling I meant it. they were calling it. Okay. And I was like, come on, these guys are fourteen and under. Like they haven't learned how to set. Yeah, yet. let them set. Yeah. Okay. But. Um, when do we I don't start? know. The first I've heard of it, and like I'm like <laughs> kind of like a little bit shocked, but at the same time, I'm not such a purist. Like I yeah. know like there's probably like Tim Hovland or some of these like ex AVP players that are like, oh, if you yeah. can't set it with no spin, like you should get called a double yeah. on. Yeah. Like they probably they're probably li- out there just listening, like cringing at the yeah. thought of watching like a yeah. double. Um, yeah, yeah. But I mean, realistically, what do you want out of a sport? You want continue continued play to be decided by the action of the players, not the actions of the ref. That's kind of what I fall back to. Sure, okay. So, like, ultimately, like, if a ref is making a judgment call that stops play and awards a point, like, on a double contact, Mm -hmm. I'd rather that they let it play and the guy had to kill the ball or there was a mistake on a pass or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I think I lean, okay. just on my initial just reaction. Just on the initial reaction, yeah. yeah. When I first initially reacted to you, I was like, oh, yeah. no. Like yeah. at first, I'm kind of a, an old school, pure, I yeah. was a little bit of a purist, um, where I like the beauty of the game. I think there's beauty in skill, yeah. and there's beauty in commitment to being good at that skill. 
Um, and if we start letting people just slap stick it up, and especially yeah. with these oh, two yeah. pro leagues coming out now, if that's what we're going to present to the public on TV, is just this ugly, like nasty slapstick yeah. volleyball. And I, I don't think it'll be completely ugly because at that level, you're still setting a pretty clean ball. Um, but just letting it kind of go, like, does it make the sport almost like unwatchable? I don't, I don't, I don't know. But Only if it happens a lot though. It, yeah. Like the question is how, how many double calls are called in a normal higher level match? Probably mm-hmm. not that many. Probably not. You know? Yeah, I think I, it, it would it would affect more at the younger level. But yes. we're saying that we should develop. We let them develop. Let them figure out. We don't want to scare them to death. Yeah, like if yeah. they're 12 years old and they're getting called on doubles That's all the time, saying, they're like, like, I don't want to play anymore. Yeah, that, <laughs> literally last weekend I was down in the SCBA tournament in Anaheim watching like a match and just going like, I can't believe you're basically making these 12 year olds not want to ever try to set. Yeah, that's how strict you are on doubles, and yeah. that's that's not consistent across across all the referees. So then they get different levels depending on the referee. That's not yeah. a good thing either. Yeah. So when when do you think that? And this could be for either of you. When do you think that that if we were to keep calling doubles, like when is a good level or age to start demanding that you start that better s- better sets are College. better? College or probably like you know seniors yeah. like varsity. You know, oh, okay. but like even JV kids, at yeah, least in high school, like they double a lot. Yeah, they get a lot of calls on them, and it, yeah. it discour- it's discouraging, especially for a kid that's trying to learn how to set for the first time. Yeah, well, I definitely see both sides. Like it doesn't make the play better. Um, it's not an advantage. Yeah, it's not to, an advantage. To, it's not an advantage, but it also. I just, I'm into the discipline. <laughs> I love the discipline part of it. I'm a discipline coach. Um, so I, I like the, the beauty of the, of the technique of, of watching someone who's really good at it become really good at it. Otherwise, like anybody, anybody could set it. One of our tech guys could go out and set on a, on a college team if we're gonna let doubles go. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know that it makes the game better yeah. or worse. I definitely see both sides. Hey, we're gonna have to do a little bit of a time check just cause for his practice. Are you are we able to pause for a second? Yeah, no worries. Um, we're at eighty minutes. Okay. I mean, it's almost it's almost seven. Okay, it's so we gotta get to seven. I think I think it's yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so we'll 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 closing. we'll wrap. It. I'll do a little a little closing. Um, right. and this may not require any kind of an answer or anything, but since we have the picture up, I've got Gabe here. Yeah. Um, and he's clearly well above the net there. Um, and I think there's a couple more. Um, I mean, sh- and this could be angles, probably not. Is, I mean, because you're six ten and you jump well, uh, and the net is only just shy of eight feet um, for the men's game. So, and you know, right there, all I, you, all you, you have to I, do. I jumped well. I don't <laughs> jump well now. <laughs> then, in these pictures, you were you were jumping well. You're yes. you're in peak performance. Um, but you're, you know, with very little effort, all you have to do is jump a couple inches and your face is exposed above the net. Do you think it's time to maybe, even considering that training has gotten a lot more advanced um, and the men, the guys have gotten more physical than we were when we were, when we were younger, um, do you think it's time to raise the men's net? No. No? <laughs> it's plenty high for you. It's plenty high enough? It's hard enough as it is. What do you think, Harper? Is it high enough? I think it's high enough. You think it's high enough? <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. Um, yeah, well, that's all I got. Thank you guys so much for your time. That was such a yeah, fun. thank you so much for having That yeah, was such you. a fun, you know, experience to talk with you. Um, and we hope that, you know, you guys come back and, and we'll do another revisit maybe yeah. in a couple of years after you've decided what college you're going to go to. Um, yeah, and thank you guys all for watching Sports Idol Nation podcast. Sports is in our DNA. We hope it's in yours. And we'll see you next time.